And so my name is Ryan Jones. I'm a senior partnership strategist and communications manager um, at Kindred. Um, I've been with Kindred, it'll be two years in August, um, coming from the classroom. So I was a high school English teacher uh, for two years in St. Louis, Missouri before moving to middle school. And afterwards, I was in the philanthropic space for about four years before moving into Kindred. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Zakia to introduce herself. All right, good morning. I'm Zakia Sakur, Executive Director with Kindred. But in my 26th year, 20 lies, 22nd year as an, educa as an educator, um, like Ryan said, I've been a teacher, school principal. I left the principalship in 2013. And for the last nine years, I've been working with a number of ed adjacent nonprofits, supporting family work and instruction, but I find myself back uh, doing uh, more work with the community. So you'll learn more about what we do here at Kindred. Awesome. And so why are we even here today, right? And so our hope from the end of this is that participants will one, deepen their understanding of Kindred's work and the goals of dialogue groups. Um, two, we're hoping that participants will be, begin to identify ways they can build relationships with those in their communities. Three, we're hoping that participants will learn how our community has embarked on creating a shared vision of equity. And four, finally, we're hoping that participants will begin to start identifying ways that they can start the process of creating a shared vision of equity in their communities. Awesome. And I will say, uh, we're gonna also have a chance to listen or hear from some of our uh, kindred participants. Uh, we have two caregivers and uh, one school leader who we are currently working with. Uh, we had a second school leader, but unfortunately, COVID is very much still a real, th a real thing. Uh, and so she and her family uh, did test positive for it. So please send her all the positive vibes today. And we're gonna turn it over to Zakia, who's going to give us uh, an overview of Kindred. Yes, thank you, Ryan. So we're gonna make sure in the next 10 minutes that you understand everything there is to know about Kindred, but also how we support schools to build towards greater equity. And you'll notice that there is no answer. So even though we're pushing for some answers in the chat, I'm gonna give it away. There is no right answer to that question. Uh, so Kindred was founded in 2016 uh, with uh, two caregiver dialogue groups. The work was piloted in an elementary school in DC. Um, since that time, we've grown to work with 15 partner schools, one district partner, um, and four schools as part of our alumni network. Kindred envisions communities collaborating towards the creation of an anti-racist and liberated society. And we'll talk more about what that looks like and how that lives for us. Our mission is to facilitate the creation of brave spaces where community members build the mindsets, skills, and collective energy to root out systemic oppression. We know that the, one of the problems that we've been working on in the last 20 years of ed reform is to ensure that students have access and opportunities to education regardless of their identity. And we're still working to solve that problem and Kindred support school communities to really think through their role as an individual and also collectively towards realizing greater equity for students. And our work kind of evolves over three phases. We used to say years, but we've learned that this work is, is deep and it's long and we have to be a part of it for the long game. So we talk about the work in the sense of phases. Some of our partners, maybe one of them on the call has been with us maybe about four years doing this work. Um, and I'm sure if the resources were available, the partner would continue to work with us because as a school leader, there's so many things that need to be prioritized and having a partner there to help you think through, challenge you and challenge the community is really a, a, an important role. I know that because I wish in my uh, 10 years as an administrator, I had someone supporting me to do this work. But um, as I started this presentation, I talked a little bit about how we started our work working with caregivers and what we learned over the last six years of, of our work is that we really need to engage the community in this work, not just caregivers, um, not just school leaders, not just school staff. So you'll see as you enter into the Kindred journey, we work with students in our middle and high school partnerships, caregivers and school staff in this work of equity. And in the first phase of the work, we really are prioritizing uh, building relationships and equitable mindsets so that we can do this deep, difficult, challenging, every other adjective you want to use, work around equity and kind of dismantling systems of oppression within our school communities, also within ourselves. And then the second phase of the work, some of the folks who've gone through our first phase will emerge as equity leaders in the community and their different names across our school communities, where they will work towards designing a shared vision 
of equity for that school community. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And in phase three of the work, we're really thinking about ways to uh, systematize and sustain the equitable practices within a school community. All of this work is being done to ensure these very important long-term uh, impacts of our work. One, that all community members have a sense of belonging, that there are no differences in how students achieve based on their race, social economic in uh, income, language, anything. We don't want um, identity to be a barrier for students as it is that we see today. Um, we wanna maintain a balance or create a balance of power between students, caregivers, staff, and school leadership where each of these stakeholder groups are contributing to the decisions that are best for the community. Ultimately, we would love to create a culture of anti-racism and a pursuit of liberation within that school community. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we go about uh, building relationships and equitable mindsets um, in our work thus far. Uh, we've been working with school communities for about six years and we started out using a dialogue to action approach. And so we'll talk a little bit about that approach to our work. We are also learning as we do this work across the city and also in our national partnership that we need other options for ways to engage folks in this phase one work. So we have been exploring other ways to do that. We'll talk about, and we'd love to learn from you all as well if there's some ideas from folks who are actually joining us uh, because we are building out this work even further now. So the Kendrick journey illustrates the components of our work. Um, and one of our primary modes uh, of this phase one work is really this dialogue to action approach. And through this approach, we aim to build trust and relationships with identity groups and across lines of difference. Uh, we wanna continuously process our own and learning uh, about other people's identities and how they identify themselves. And then we wanna take action together to cultivate school communities where everyone can thrive. And so we know that that is not where we are living right now. But that is the aim of this work. And this dialogue really uncovers a lot of our own bias, our own thoughts that actually contribute to the actions that we take within school communities, within, within our day-to-day -day lives. So to date, uh, we have supported uh, folks, like I said, through this dialogue approach. Um, the dialogue sessions support reflection and growth for participants, starting with their understanding of their racial identity and racial identity in general, but also um, their engagement with anti-racism efforts. So folks come into dialogue at various places, which makes it very um, interesting. Uh, and, and some of our participants will talk a little bit about that, but someone, there could be folks who do DEI work day to day who are in the dialogue and um, someone who's an engineer. And so they're in the same dialogue experience, really trying to unpack and uncover uh, what equity looks like within the school community. Um, so we are also, uh, this new curriculum, you'll see the 10 sessions. We work with folks 90 minutes for 10 sessions over 10 or 20 weeks, um, depending on the school community. Um, and we have gotten feedback from our communities as we do every year um, about the impact of the curriculum on, on them. And we made some revisions. So you'll see, this is our updated uh, Kendrick curriculum for the dialogue. And as you can see, what comes through our dialogue is that our caregivers who participate in dialogue are able to now have more greater confidence in having conversations about race and also taking action towards greater equity within their school communities. And this is what our data speaks to here. So when you talk about dialogue to action, we really want folks to have these conversations to better understand where they are and then to work together to take action towards greater equity within their schools. Ryan, we can move to the next slide. So oh, let me add one thing there. In addition to the dialogue groups I, I share with you, typically we've done dialogue groups. There've been a couple of school communities where we found that other approaches have been better suited for those communities. We've had empathy interviews that we've done with students in our middle and high school partnerships, um, equity audits that we are conducting with certain school communities, leadership coaching for all of our school leaders, 
in a school leader professional learning community. So the leaders also have an opportunity to go through these equity journeys um, and support their school communities as other members of the community are also going through the similar work. So let's talk about what phase two uh, of this work looks like. In phase two, the community works together to identify the outcomes, which are contextualized by that school community. So you'll see every community decides something different, moves them towards greater equity. Um, and so we'll talk about um, how folks have landed at some of the uh, outcomes for their community. We can move to the next slide, Ryan. Okay, so this each bullet represents a different school community um, and the work that they've done in phase two. One school prioritized increasing the staff of color to be more representative of their student body. This is a bilingual school here in DC and through the dialogue, one piece of their vision towards greater equity was to have the staff be more representative of the student body. And so they worked towards that. In another community, the equity team, which were participants that came out of the phase one dialogue, decided to increase the number of uh, staff of, of people of color, caregivers of color on the PTA executive board. This is a very powerful uh, an influential PTA within the community, but also within the school community, within the broader community in, in, the, in the neighborhood. And through this equity work, the equity team decided that they really wanted to prioritize having greater representation uh, within the PTA executive leadership. And finally, this final community um, is one where uh, there's a school community that had never had a, container for um, parent voice and advocacy. And they decided to create a PTA. And I know for some folks maybe on this call, having a school that has, has having a PTA does not seem monumental. But in this school community that has been um, impacted by gentrification, um, violence, many of the, most of the students in the school community are on free and reduced lunch. There's been so many issues within the community where parents could not prioritize kind of the advocacy within the school community. This work has been very, very, very important to the school community to have a space for parent voice and advocacy. And so this is really um, monumental for that community. That's a little bit about Kendrick's work, uh, the phases of our work and also what our partners have been able to do as we really support them to contextualize what does equity look like within our community and how can we uh, make sure that we have a different experience for our community that lead toward greater equity. Ryan. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it to what everyone's been waiting for. I'm going to introduce some of our school partners. Uh, so we have three of our partners joining us today. Two of them are caregivers, and then one is a school leader. Um, all, all three are from local DC public schools. And so I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves, and then we'll begin our panel. So Nelson, take it away. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. That's so funny because I always volunteer other people. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Nelson Burton. Um, I am the father of a third grader at Watkins Elementary School in Washington, DC. I am a former uh, school administrator and teacher here in DC as well. Sarah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sarah Cisna. I am a parent of a kiddo at Peabody Elementary and another kiddo at Watkins Elementary, um, just in Washington, DC. Just to say the Capitol Hill Cluster School is a unique DC public school in that it is one school with three campuses. So we go from pre-K three um, to kindergarten at Peabody, and then first through fifth at Watkins Elementary, and then we have sixth through eighth at the middle school, Stuart Hobson. So we're all under one um, administrative umbrella of sorts, um, but the work that we've been doing with Kindred is Peabody and Watkins in the elementary level. Um, and uh, Nelson and I were in a dialogue group together last year in phase one, I like that. Um, and I currently co-facilitate a, a combined caregiver staff group and Ryan is our facilitating advisor.
Good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on um, which time zone you're in. <laughs> my name is Tamika Sykes. I'm the principal at Amadon Bowen Elementary School. This is my sixth year um, at the school, and we've had a relationship with Kindred since 2017, 2018. Happy to be here. Ryan, you went on to the mute. Yes, thank you so again. Always have my back, Sarah. I appreciate that. We uh, think alike. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. And first question is, um, how did you actually become involved with Kindred? And what has been the impact of Kindred on either the school community or on yourself uh, as a participant or a caregiver? So I guess I'll start. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I'm laughing because I know the answer. <laughs> so I didn't want to. All right, my wife made me. So what happened was she, I always fuss about stuff and I complain about things that are going on. And she fussed at me about, you know what? You need to get involved. I complained and complained and complained. And my, my, my apprehension about getting involved was um, from my experience. Having worked in schools and seen one initiative after another, come and go and not really having support. I was like, it was a waste of time, it was a waste of money. Why are we doing it? You know what, count me out. Um, but uh, my wife said no. <laughs> so, but- You I'm were glad. a reluctant participant. I was a very reluctant participant, um, but coming in, coming in, you know, I was, the, 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 the shift uh, quickly changed. So I, I'll stop there and then we'll come back around. <laughs> Sarah, how'd you come to this work? <laughs> I know, I'm like, how did I come to this work? Um, I, I, uh, we started at a different elementary school uh, uh, nearby, also DC Public School. Um, so DC Public Schools, for those of you that don't know, um, there is pre-K offered through um, DC Public Schools, but you're not guaranteed a spot at your in-boundary school. We have school choice. Um, you're guaranteed a spot at your neighborhood school starting in kindergarten. So you have to go through a lottery system to try to get a pre-K spot. You're not necessarily going to get one in your inbound school. So Peabody and Watkins are inbound school, but we went to a different one for pre-K three and pre-K four, also closest to us. Um, where uh, I would, I think the population is 60% um, black, 40% white, basically. Um, I was definitely, I definitely uh, felt uh, like I was in a minority and I was like, wow, I need to, uh, you know, and I never really felt like I was able to become a part of the community. And then, but at the same time, I really valued the fact that um, the school was not filled with a bunch of white kids, that, that it was, there was all kinds of folks, right? But then going to Peabody Watkins, especially at Peabody, like I literally came home after the first day and I was like, why is Peabody so white? And, um, and, and Watkins is less so, but, but I thought, I was like, that's strange. And why is it so white? We live in DC. Uh, so um, it became clear that there were some things to work out and I was really excited to learn and listen. Um, I think someone mentioned that at the beginning about learning and listening, and, and that was really important. Then I met Nelson. <laughs> well, I guess it's my turn. Go to me. Go. Um, <laughs> um, thank you both for getting involved. I'm coming from the perspective of um, a school leader um, who was selected. Right down the road. Right down the road, yes. <laughs> Um, who was selected to um, become the new principal of Amadon Bowen um, Elementary School. I'd lived and worked in DC off and on um, for about 12 to 13 to 15 years, I guess, before I came back. Um, so I came back to a DC, I, I was in Chicago and I came to DC to um, a DC that had changed um, since um, I had lived and worked in the city. Um, and I refer to that first year as kind of um, year zero um, because you're, you know, you're joining a community and so you're getting to know the community. And shortly after my arrival, I was connected with the um, founding um, executive director 
um, who said, you know, you, you might want to talk to Laura. She's doing some work at Marie Reed, and I think this might be something that would be good for Amadon. Um, we are a um, community school, and so we had a school partner who was able to um, provide the financial support that would be needed for us to initially get involved. And so that's kind of the way that um, I came to the work. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, Nelson and Sarah, this question is specifically for you as caregivers. Um, what is hard from your perspective about the co-designing a vision for equity with your school uh, from your perspective as a caregiver? Is it easy if I put these in the chat too? Sure. Sure. All right. Just jumping off. Um, getting getting buy-in. When, when, when you're trying to move a vision in any organization, it's it comes down to getting the buy-in. Um, when you start talking about equity, some people uh, feel defensive because if we're talking, if we're saying that our community isn't an equitable space, then you're saying I'm racist. All right, and, and, and people, you know, they, they, they get very defensive and they, they feel like, you know, you're, you're pointing at them and saying that they're the problem when you're looking for them to be a part of the solution. I think that's kind of what we ran into and, uh, and, and Sarah can speak to it more, but I felt like some of the folks that were in position to really change the culture that existed were resistant to it because they felt like they were being uh, identified as the ones who were the problem instead of being the ones who can be a part of uh, the solution. Um, that's that that in, in 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 my experience and based on what I see, I think that was probably the biggest um, the biggest obstacle that I saw was really people pushing back feeling like, you know what, you're accusing me of something here. Um, you're not trying to, to, to help. You, you're saying what I did wrong, you know? Thank you. I'll, I'll just mention a practical aspect of when we started this work. So we started our work with Kindred um, in the Cluster School uh, 2020 to 2021. So we were in the middle of a global pandemic. We were not, kids were not in school at that point. Um, all of our interactions have been virtual. Um, so I think sometimes there's just, there was just like a, a literal physical, like how can we like rally together when we weren't even able to see each other in person. So, and then when we started seeing each other in person in dribs and drabs, like it was amazing. All of a sudden it felt real and, and like, oh, we can affect change, right? Like we're and that, we're not just and, and like you're taller than I thought, but also like we're not just faces and rectangles, but like we do have power um, like together. But you, you bring up COVID and that that was a challenge uh, too, because there wasn't that social aspect um, mm -hmm. that comes with getting to know people. And right. when you're having difficult conversations, that social uh, interaction mm -hmm. becomes really, really important. And doing doing it through zoom you know you don't you just don't have it, it, it it's not the same you're not in the same room and and you know it, it it's hard to it, it's like like uh getting a text message you know like you really can't appreciate the tone you, and you need to see yeah. the body language of people especially when you're having those those really uh difficult conversations and you know i, I think back to the the dialogue groups in, in phase one, some of those conversations were very difficult to have. Um, some, you know, I, I talked about being defensive about some things. And to be honest, sometimes I got defensive. You know, I, I felt, you know what, they're talking about me, you know? And, and it's, it's, it's different when, when, you're on, when you're on Zoom. Mm -hmm. But I think for some other personalities, being on Zoom might have been what they needed. It may have been that that slight step back that allowed them to open up a little bit more. You mm -hmm. know, so um, I know for me, it 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 left me feeling like I 
are they understanding what I'm saying? Are they hearing me? You know, is my point coming across? And where some others may have thought like, you know, it was a comfortable space for them being on the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm also chuckling because Sarah and I did get to meet in person after working with one another for over a year. And I did indeed say you're much taller than I expected. So, uh, that's her point. Apparently I come across as short. I'm 5'8", <laughs> but yeah, multiple people are like, you're so tall. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, thank you both. But yeah, but like, so look at that. So Ryan and I have been, we've been talking to each other, like seeing each other on Zoom at least once a week for a year and a half. And just only, only a, like weeks ago, did we actually meet in person? Yes, I'm going to um, uh, To Sarah Nelson, but if Tamika, if you also want to speak to this, if schools are just beginning this work, what is one thing you suggest they start doing? Um, whether it's with Kindred, without Kindred, what is one thing that you would suggest schools start doing if they want to do this work? Well, that's, a, that's a big, that's a big um, question. I think um, just to provide a little bit of context, um, one of the things that was challenging in terms of coming into the Amazon community is that um, the neighborhood was rapidly changing in terms of the um, identities of the students and the families. Um, there's also a, um, a real um, urgency around improving academic outcomes and achievement for the students who attend the school. Um, and then there were also a number of please, historical... Mr. Walker, please come to the main office. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, please go to the office. Sorry about that. There are a number of um, historical factors that contributed to the kind of situation that we were in. And so if I were to quickly kind of provide like the, the context, here I am a new principal coming in. Um, Day in the school. Day I'm, school. Near, I'm new to student staff and families. Um, I didn't have an assistant principal or an instructional coach. Um, I am an African-American woman, that's how I identify, but there are still many differences between myself and the community I serve. In a way, I'm still an outsider because I'm not from DC and I had most recently, well, I had worked in, in DC public schools for a while, I had most recently um, left the classroom from E.L. Haynes Public Charter School. So there are a number of things to kind of consider coming back into this context. And I think that um, uh, for me, feeling like the school leader and feeling the uh, pressure of many things, right? And having the view of everything that we had on our plate and what we had to do, it was um, really um, helpful to have the, su the support um, or the background support of um, Kindred in terms of prioritizing what is really most important and what kind of connects us, right? So I think many people probably came into the experience, when I say people, the parents that were participating in the dialogue group probably came into the experience thinking that um, the white families and uh, the families that has had historically attended the school um, had different ideas of what they wanted um, and their goals were different. Um, when really, I think once they came together, they all wanted a school that was safe. They all wanted a school that was going to challenge and support and love on their kids. Their ideas maybe about how to achieve that were different, but our goals were really the same. And, and just that one thing was so powerful in terms of building that initial amount of trust that, that made people say, okay, I'll hold on for a little bit. You know, I remember very clearly having a chat and chew um, it, where I was literally chewed up by some of the families and saying, you know, Amadon is not my school of choice. This is the school my kids have to go to because they live here. And I don't like this and I don't like this and I don't like this and I don't like this. And um, I took it because they, you know, in many ways they were right and perception is reality and there was work that we had to do. But having the parents be able to have a space where they could talk about their, um, their concerns about the school, but then also have the, um, like, uh, what's the word that I wanna use? Having someone also kind of, okay, funnel it to, what is something that we can prioritize? What would step one be? What would be actionable um, for us to try to um, uh, attack or, or, or um, work on? And you start to gain some traction there. So I guess overall to like sum it up, I would say, assess where you are. It doesn't matter if you're a school that has a lot to do 
in terms of academics, culture, and, and all these other things, um, there's something, there's some central, like, uh, connecting, like, idea that will get you started. And I would invite people to, to cast a wide net in terms of trying to determine what that is. And I found um, the dialogue groups are a good way to kind of get a sample of the families that represent Amadon Bowen and have that group come together to kind of push forward towards mm -hmm. this is what we want right now. We want a lot of things, but we want you to prioritize this. I appreciate that. I, um, what I would suggest in getting started is um, create opportunities for interaction, create opportunities for parents to meet each other in a just a social setting where they can say, hello, my name is Nelson. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Sarah. Creating that understanding, uh, like Tamika was saying about um, realizing that the goals were the same, but expecting them to be different. Getting to know and getting talking just in, and I always say just a very relaxed social atmosphere just having, having a conversation with someone who doesn't look like you, doesn't live where you live, um, and perhaps doesn't think the way you think, just having a conversation, it, it, it bridges a gap. Whether you walk away loving that person or, not, person or not, you walk away knowing Sarah said this, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, I coach Little League Baseball and a lot of the kids from the school uh, play in the league. And I've had a bunch of, uh, uh, folks from the school who that see all the time and not speak to, but they would see me at the field. And because my kid was playing uh, baseball, their kid is playing baseball, they felt like they had a connection with me and they felt comfortable walking up to me and say, hey, Nelson, I want to introduce myself. So having those opportunities, creating those opportunities where people can start to, uh, one, get to know each other and find those, uh, those similarities, find those, those common commonalities, where they can feel more comfortable connecting with each other is a fantastic start to uh, getting this type of work uh, rolling. It, it'll really give you a jump shot in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what are some additional bodies of work that have started since the beginning of your partnership with Kindred? So after dialogue groups, what's happened afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> oh. This time last year, <laughs> there were two dialogue groups last year. There was a, a caregiver one and a staff one. And then we, we came together as an equity team. And, um, and, and, and basically at, at the end of one of our sessions, we we're like, so basically we're going to take over the PTA. Um, and, 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 and that, that, that was our goal. Because we knew that in our school, the PTA controls the the culture, the tone, and um, and and the folks that are in there, um, you know, are are making the decisions and 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 leading leading how things are approached. And you know, they had already committed to funding Kindred, which was a great step. Um, but, but we're like, if we really want to affect change, we got to get in there where the decisions are being made. So Nelson and I both ended up on the executive committee. <laughs> that, that's what that looked like. That's what it looked like. <laughs> Specifically, uh, executive committee of nine and the two of us ended up on there. And then we have other people like all throughout, um, some, some folks were like, wait, I don't know that I signed up for this, but, um, but <laughs> that and Nelson's on the nominating committee this year so like ensuring that these voices um are are becoming part of, of like we're we're making sure that this we're able to change the culture of our school because we're in there making the decisions so and, and as I think is the big the big one yeah changing the culture from within because a lot of the complaints from members of the community was that the PTA was unapproachable um, it was exclusive. If uh, you weren't in the group, you were you weren't in the group. I mean, it was kind of like a, a mean girl thing going on. Um, yeah, we want we want we want inclusion. Um, come on, uh, we want to hear your voice, but really, we just want to say we checked that box. We asked you, you know, and that's what it was. And so, like uh, Sarah said, we 
we said we we're going to take over the PTA and jokingly and what we've done is we've infiltrated it and yeah. I think um we've made it more inclusive um, I know we have, like we're not like throwing up walls and being like ah you're all racist like that's not <laughs> what we're doing but here's the thing <laughs> initially I think some of them felt that way because yeah. the 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 PTA prior to our joining was mostly white and very, very of one mind, I'll say. Uh, you know, they, 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 they got along and they, you know what, they, they, they brought their, their voice to it. However, when, uh, when we got on, um, I just pushed back. And sometimes I pushed back just to see where the room was, to see who in the room had a differing thought. And what I found out was there were some folks who were just going along to get along. You know, they didn't necessarily agree. They weren't, um, when I was talking about people feeling uh, attacked, the, the PTA at our school was seen as a racist group that controlled the school. Um, and I thought that way as well. When I got into the group, I realized that they came off that way, but they weren't. It was just, there were no black people there. There were no black, black voices being heard. Um, and we just, we tried to move it by introducing certain things. There was, they had a, an inclusion event that occurred last year. I wasn't a part of, and they wanted to do it this year. And I'm like, well, what did you do with the information you learned last year? So we changed up what we did. And we actually took a lot of what we did in the, in the kindred dialogue groups for the sessions we did um, around a book study. Mm -hmm. um, because we wanted, we wanted folks to, to get talking about race and actually own the fact that, you know what? We have a racial problem. Let's talk about it, and, but make it comfortable. And so uh, Sarah uh, was kind enough to co-host with me and we did a book study and we had a conversation about race. We had a real conversation about race. We had some uncomfortable conversations amongst the 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 entire PTA board, which in Oscar was humongous, but it was a fantastic conversation. What um, we got positive feedback, but I know there was some hurt feelings coming out of it. But it it got a conversation going and had people calling me who had never called me to say, you know what, I never thought about that. I never thought about the way black families uh, feel when they come into the uh, cluster. I never thought about you know so. We're making some headway. I feel good about the work we've done. Um, the book was uh, "You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey." Um, so it's actually a very, it's a very funny book. Uh, it's a horrible book at the same time, in that all the stuff that happens is horrible. Um, but it's by it's by Amber Ruffin and her sister Lacey, Lacey Lamar. Yeah, um, and. And it's a great book to read. It's a, it, Nelson chose a book that was really, it was an engaging read. I listened to it too. Um, they, the two sisters narrate it and it's hysterical. Um, but we use something that wasn't, you know, like Jen academic text about race. Um, you know, something that was a little bit more of a way in um, and that seemed to be really helpful. I will say another thing that, um, we unfortunately had a couple of, oh, oh, right. You may know our school because it was in the national press in December when our librarian had students enact the Holocaust. Um, I say that like with humor now, but, um, but it was horrible and um, on so many levels, but, uh, uh, but the response to that, and then another incident that happened in our school um, a couple of months later, um, we as, um, as a group were able to come together and provide support to our community um, in a way and facilitate conversations um, that we never would have been able to do had we not gone through phase one and then several of us um, have gone through facilitator training too. So it wasn't just 
outside forces descending and saying, here's how you shall heal from this. You know, like we were able to like caregiver to caregiver um, facilitate conversations and dialogues, uh, you know, to let folks be heard. So I, I think that's one of the most meaningful things to come out. And, and some <laughs> in our group, they're like, we're like the strike force superhero, come in, you know. Um, but it, but it, that has been, I think, really helpful. And, and we're slowly but surely working our kindred community agreements into various meetings. And like people now on the regular in a, like in non-kindred space meeting will be like, I'm, I'm being raggedy. I'm embracing my right to be raggedy, which is one of the community agreements. So. And to go back to your original question, I'll say that had I not participated uh, in kindred, I wouldn't have uh, taken a leadership role in the PTA. I probably wouldn't have uh, been as um, as active around the school as I am. Um, and and to be honest, it started with for me. It started with the initial assignment we had after the first meeting, after the first uh, meeting of the dialogue group. With we did the the what did they call it? The kin help me. Kin work connector. Kin work. And I got connected with Sarah. And Sarah's one of my friends now. I mean, it, 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 that's where it started. And that, that half hour that we had carved out to talk, it turned into about an hour and a half. It, it was that, that was the start. And then when in connecting with some other folks, I said, look, it was the longest uh, conversation I had with a white lady ever. Uh, <laughs> just one-on-one -on -one in just a, 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 a social space, just, just talking. And, uh, Later, someone said to me during uh, one of the dialogues, and after the dialogue session, she said, she sent me a message, she's about three or four uh, sessions in. She sent a message, she said, no, I found out, I find out something new about you every week. And I was like, hey, that's kind of the purpose of this thing, huh? <laughs> it made that sense. That continues on, that also continues on. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it just made sense, so yeah. It was a good experience for me. All right, has, Tamika, we don't wanna- yeah, <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Sarah tends to uh, talk a lot. <laughs> Did you want to, um, well, I, I can connect us and in segue into um, the piece in terms of how COVID kind of impacted um, our school community. I mean, I think we're a little further down the line than um, Watkins um, Peabody is. Um, to, to respond to the question, we had an equity team that came from that um, initial dialogue group. Um, one of the things that was really important is that there were diverse um, um, parents that were at the table in terms of school-based decision-making. Um, the LSAT, um, which is a, um, a school advisory group in DC and the PTA were seen, um, were, were seen as bodies that um, were mostly middle-class, mostly um, white that um, had influence in terms of making the school decisions that were budget-based and even um, time in front of the principal. And so it was really important that we were thinking about including the equity team as um, a, a layer and a lens that we used in all of the work that we do. The next thing that we did was to increase the um, number of um, dialogue groups and to continue to recruit um, because part of the goal there was to make sure that um, we were able to create something that was sustainable and we wanted to get more people involved because there's a lot of work to do and you don't want the work to be concentrated in only the, the hands of a few people you need many people to have had a similar kind of experience and be feel safe enough in order to engage in a meaningful way. And then my goal at the school, um, you know, each year Kindred would, would say, oh, well, you know, you have one more year, you have this out, however many more years. I'm like, no, we can't stop yet. You know, we need our teachers to go through this experience and then we want this. So, um, so that's kind of how, um, the dialogue groups have evolved into um, creating leaders that are willing to take on other work in other parts, right? So the people who participate okay. in the dialogue groups start to believe and trust and um, feel strongly. And so then they're willing to go out and recruit other people, mm -hmm. even if the other people aren't necessarily 
the leaders of some of these other committees, they're willing to come to the meetings and to be, you know, more involved. Yeah. Um, COVID was a really hard hit because we we had come to a stance where all of our big events that we had were kind of co-sponsored by the PTA and Vibe and the school, right? We had a parent um, um, or family or caregiver um, aspect um, and math night, back to school night, the black history program, the winter program, all of those things were really things that were big community events where everyone had fun and came together. And when COVID happened, they weren't able to do that. Well, that the the people who had originally been in that um, that uh, kindred group um, used our new school playground. Our school playground was renovated um, during that summer, and they started to gather outside and bring their kids. I mean, on the weekends. And when I tell you, <coughs> that was a big thing. They were really on me about making sure that the playground was open um, and um, accessible. Um, because it was a place that they were able to come and build community or yeah. continue the community that was built and that was built. And there are people who have since moved away from the neighborhood because of the cost of living um, and still bring their kids back um, after school and on the weekends for these gatherings. Um, so what we have found now is that that cohort of kids and families are really tight, but now we have a gap from the new families who haven't even been able to really be in the school in the way that others have. Um, and um, we really see this as an opportunity to kind of pick up that work again. One thing that they decided to do was to have a, an intentional play date before the PTA meeting. So um, 5.30 last week, I was getting fillings. Unfortunately, I had two fillings that had to be <laughs> replaced. So I wasn't able to go, but it didn't matter because there are plenty of people to pick up the work and make sure that it continued. And, you know, the next day, I mean, they sent video, there was pizza, they had over 30 folks show up um, to the 5.30 play date before the business that they had to talk about in terms of PTA, which was around elections and, you know, a few other um, things. So I think um, the, the, it reinforced people who were already um, open. Those folks who had gone through the experience doubled down. I mean, they were um, trying to figure out what it is that we needed to do to get groceries um, uh, to families that um, of families who are out of work. Um, they were um, really pushing for us to get all of the support with the technology, which is a big lift for our school. We, we were not one to one. Um, prior to COVID. So they were really thinking about and pushing me and saying, hey, Ms. Sykes, what are we doing for our families that can't afford this or can't, you know, or who aren't working or the loss? I mean, that was another thing, really pushing additional support for mental health and grief counseling um, for families that were um, experiencing loss. So it, what it really has done is made them care about the person next to them, you know? Um, and I just, it really in and of itself really turned, help us turn the corner um, and get through a time that was really difficult. Um, I think that um, we are excited about the opportunity to start to pick up those in-person um, activities um, that you all had mentioned, because I think they are so key. You know, they're low stakes, they're easy to do, and um, it really, people, I don't know, I'm a person who has a feeling. Like you go into a space and you feel, right? What it's like, someone can tell you, but you wanna go check it out for yourself. And unless you're able to actually feel that when you come and drop off your kid or you come and pick up your kid, then it's hard to believe. So um, I would say just start small, start where you can. At Amazon, it started with a hello campaign. I'll say this and then I, I'll be quiet because I have to go to uh, lunch duty in a few minutes. But um, the group said, you know what? We want to start just with saying hello. Like, you know, hello, 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 hello. And they handed out cards. Hey, you know, get to know, you know, someone just speak to them at arrival, speak to them at dismissal. Um, there was these cute little cards. I'm like, I, do I have one on my desk still? Anyway, the point is, is that 
Um, these are all things that were generated um, and executed by my families, by the, by the, by the parents. Um, and that cohort um, is now in, in third grade of those kids who really started in pre-K three and four, most of their older children, they have younger children here now too, but most of their older children are in third grade. Um, so I'm a believer. Um, I guess the last thing that I would say to you is if you are a school that doesn't have um, the resources to pay out of pocket for um, Kindred, um, engage your community, engage a community partner, think about grant opportunities. Um, I just would not have been in, I might be speaking, I mean, I don't know what the model is like moving on, um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it has been well worth um, the investment um, and my staff members who have participated, we've had three staff dialogue groups at this point and they have said it's the single most meaningful like wow. additional like outside of like you know experience in terms of having them feel a part of and connected to um each other and um the school that they've that they've had and that's pretty significant wow. that's huge wow. well thank you to our panelists we really appreciate your time energy uh not just to this conversation but throughout your work with kindred uh so thank you for joining us today I know we have a minute left. Uh, I wanted to give the floor for any questions that folks may have. I saw a few questions in the chat. Um, there's a question around sustainability. Um, happy to answer that, but also can offer it to our panelists as well. Um, but I will say each uh, conversation around sustainability, sustainability has looked different with each different school context um, and what they're working on. Uh, and so I will offer that input. I will also agree, like th that is the, the trickiest thing I think that we feel. We feel really strong in our dialogue group and we're like, how do we, how do we make this go out? Because also what Tamika said, when you go into a space, like there's just a feeling. And I think the thing that we have struggled with the most is how to describe our kindred experience to others. Um, and, and someone, I think someone in our group expressed it the best way. She's like, I can come to any of our sessions and no matter what kind of day I've had, if I am just empty, my cup is full. And I just find that after, um, right? To make it right, you're like, you can have been pounded down. It doesn't matter what, but after that 90 minutes together, like my cup is full. And I feel like a renewed person in a way that nothing, nothing else has done that. As far as uh, sustaining it, uh, sustaining the progress, number one, you have to have uh, buy-in from the leadership. The leadership yeah. has to be willing to invest in, in keeping it going, uh, which goes back to what I was saying about my initial uh, trepidations about getting involved, period. It's like, you have to have that, that commitment from the leadership to continue to carry it forward. In addition, you have to have people who are willing to multiply, to reach out and, and pull more people in and pull more people in constantly, constantly increasing the size of the tent and bringing more people into, into that tent. I think that's where, where, it, uh, where the, the, the success of, of keeping it going and not just, just keeping the dialogue was going, but just that change in culture that comes along with it. It has, it, it, it's the people who, who are gonna move it. Uh, and as much as the program has to be strong, you have to have the people willing to, to spread the message and spread the feeling, the, the, the thought and, and the culture that come along with it.